Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good. If, uh, if you would do me a favor, if you have, if you're a veteran, if you've served in the Army at any point, do you mind just standing up for a moment? Please. Oh, awesome. Let's give these men and women a big round of applause. Thank you so much for your service. Thank you so much for what you uh, have done and keep doing for us. We really appreciate it. And happy Veterans Day. Amen? Uh, I, I came across this, uh, um, this ad, and it's, uh, it's a Marines ad, right? Have you, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this ad. Uh, pictures this man with the sword. And then beneath are these words, earned, never given. If you want to become a Marine... You want to be prepared to earn that name through sacrifice, through hardship, through training. And if you get it, it's because why? You deserve it. It's a great, great um, slogan for the Marines. Uh, but the message of the gospel is a little different, isn't it? The message of the gospel, uh, and it's not, you know, obviously, a Marine, you better know what you're doing, right? But as a soldier for Christ, it's the other way around, isn't it? It is given, never earned. Amen? Amen. Given, never earned. You cannot save yourself, but only humbly receive salvation as a gift through faith in Jesus Christ. And if you get it, you absolutely did not deserve it. I want to share with you some texts before we get into our text in Philippians today. As a reminder of something we all should know very, very well. We talk about it in this church often. It is something that I'm extremely passionate about. And I want to make sure we understand fully. And uh, so here's the first one. The first one says, for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? This is an important, important text because it says that, you know, you get, you, you get paid wages when you sin and those wages are, are death. Where on the other side, you, you, you get a gift, which is the opposite of wages, of God, which is the opposite of sin. And that gift is what? Eternal life, which is the opposite of death. How do you get eternal life? Are you guys paying attention out there? How do you get eternal life? It is a gift. Now, of course, if I give you a gift, and it's wrapped, nice paper and everything, and you say, oh, thank you so much for that gift, and you take that gift home, and uh, a few months later, I come and visit you, and I notice that you still have that gift, but it's still wrapped, and it's still there, and nobody's done anything with it. You've maybe unwrapped it, so you don't even know what it is, really. You're not even sure how to use it. So that wouldn't really be good, isn't it, right? So this gift of eternal life is something we ought to be unwrapping and using for God's glory. Amen? The second text, also very familiar to us, it says, for it is by what? Grace. grace. That is unmerited favor, Correct? For it is by grace, this unmerited favor that we have been saved through what? Faith. In other words, we must uh, uh, trust that grace. And this is not from yourselves. Please make sure that Paul keeps telling us this. This is not from yourself. It is the what? Gift of God, 
not by works, so that no one can what? Boast. Nobody can go to heaven and go, hey, I deserve to be here. I've earned it. Another great verse is this one here. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. Isn't that beautiful? If it's by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Does that make sense? I mean, the whole idea of grace is that it is grace. It is unmerited favor. So far, so good. One last one for now. And it goes like this. He who has saved us and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our what? Works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. In other words, from day one, when, when the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit decided, you know, we're going to send, we're going we're to create humans, and, and, and we know what's going to happen, and, there, and there's going to be this fall. Here's what we know from eternity past. Here's what we know. We're going to make sure that where sin abounds, grace will that much more abound. We will always have more grace than sin could ever quench. Isn't that awesome? I love that. So now we come to today's passage, which is a favorite one of those who believe that we are saved by works. And it's the same author. It's Paul. Paul has just told us, no, grace, 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 grace. It is a gift. There's no way you can be saved by works over and over and over again. And then we come to this passage in Philippians. This is where we are in our series. And in this passage it says, therefore... My dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to do what? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. How many of you, like this is your favorite verse? No? <laughs> See, here's what I hear from people that are strong components of salvation by works. This, you're supposed to be fearing and trembling. You're supposed to be scared of God. In fact, your salvation is in constant jeopardy. And if you're not afraid of losing your salvation, you won't work hard for it. you got to work hard for it. You must be trembling before God. This is what Paul is saying. All right, let's have closing prayer. <laughs> Wouldn't that be terrible? Leave it there. That would just, oh my goodness. Just kidding. So let's look at this verse closely. Are you willing to unwrap and unpack this verse with me? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Um, hopefully, as we unpack it, uh, we can put aside this notion forever of, of salvation by works. So he says, therefore... My dear friends, as you have always obeyed. Who is he talking to, by the way? The Philippians, right? These are the people in Philippi. He's writing this letter. He says, look, you're my friends. And as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence. So apparently, whenever he showed up, they were really good. Right? He says, but now, much more in my what? Absence. You've always obeyed in my presence, now much more in my absence. Kind of begs the question, who are you when no one's looking? I know, when the pastor shows up, you're doing great. If you know I'm coming, the house is clean, the dishes are done, everything's great. If you don't know I'm coming, that could be a problem. And Paul here is saying, look, I know that in my presence you've always obeyed, but now I want you to make sure that you do that in my what? Absence. And then he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear 
and trembling. Now, I, I want to make sure that you follow me here. This is probably the most important thing that I'm going to say here. It does not say work for your salvation. Have you noticed that? It says something really strange. It says work out your salvation. Not only that, but with fear and trembling. Have you ever experienced fear and trembling? No? Have you ever, have you ever seen flashing lights behind as you're driving? <laughs> and the first thing you do is you look at what? How fast am I going? Is my seatbelt on, right? In New York, I used to look at how fast I was going. Is my seatbelt on? And in New York, I used to have a sign that said clergy. And I'd always put that on the, on the window right away, just in case, right? Maybe they would have mercy on me. So uh, this is where English and Greek collide. This is really important to understand here. Uh, so let me see if I can help here. So when I, I came here from Italy, I, English is my second language. Obviously, by now you figure that out. And uh, I make up words, all kinds of stuff. That's okay. Uh, but I, I, there were certain idioms that really I never, I never understood. Right? I'd go out there and, and, and play some soccer, and, and some friend would say, hey, go break a leg. No. I don't want to break a leg. I'm trying to play a game here, right? Or, or somebody would, would, would say, um, uh, uh, you're driving me up the wall. Okay. I, I, know, I know we're used to this language, but, but if you're not, if English is your second language, these are weird, right? I'm under the weather. What, what, what does that mean? I'm quitting cold turkey. Like, why would you eat cold turkey anyway, right? I mean, just, you know, I, so, so I'm sitting here and I'm, and I, why, what is it with these words? And quite honestly, we have them in, in Italy too. For example, in Italy, if we want to say good luck, we would say in bocca al lupo, which means in the mouth of the wolf, right? But I know what that means. Of course, it means good luck. Well, so apparently... If you look at it in context, and if you look at the wording that Paul uses, apparently, uh, as he says, as you always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation. The Greek words here suggest cause and effect. As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the words work out are, in the Greek, are, are, are from the word kata and ergomazi, which basically mean to fully accomplish, by implication, finish what you've started. And the word for salvation is the same as the word for rescue. So basically, what Paul is saying is, look, you've always obeyed. Everything was great. Not only in my presence, but now much more, I need you to do it in my absence. So finish to rescue the problem that you have right now, which is disunity. If you remember, as we read the book of Philippians, it's, uh, he keeps reminding them, you've got to have the same mindset as Jesus. That you all work together as one. You must have unity. You must be together. And so this problem was apparently very big there. And so Paul is saying, look, when I was there, you were all united. And now I need you to be united in my, in my absence too. So continue to finish that work. Rescue this situation. It was kind of like an idiom for them. That's why it's not work for your salvation, but work out your salvation. It's a weird way of saying it. How do you work out your salvation? In other words, what Paul was saying was, you've got to be able to work this out. This disunity is going to cause challenges. 
Because Jesus said by this, oh man, you will know that you are my disciples if you what? If you have love for one another. And right now, it's becoming more and more difficult. I mean, you're so good, you're so generous, you do so many good things. But right now, what's happening is that you are really losing ground and you are losing um, uh, respect because you are so disunited. In fact, so much so that I, can, I hear about it here in Rome, in this jail. I need you to work together. Now, pastor, that sounds good, okay. But what about the fear and trembling part? We, uh, in, in my leadership class, uh, we would, it got to the point where it, it started the first year. I would say something, you know, and, and which the, the students had never heard before. Something as simple as, you know, true leaders lead by permission, not by position. And then somebody would go, wow. And I'd be like, what's going on? And she would say, I just had a wow. And so as, as, as the year went on, somebody else would go, oh, I just had another wow moment, right? And we would then, so then we coined this phrase, the wow moment. Now, uh, this fear and trembling, again, this was a, a common saying back then. And it did not mean to, to be afraid and to, to, to like shake in your fear. To fear and tremble, it was kind of a, a common thing that basically said, you need to come together and you need to be able uh, to, to be in wow. Right now, you're losing the wow. Uh, in, in another letter, John, uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, G, he's quoting uh, this this, this uh, 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 Revelation from Jesus, and he says, you've lost your first love. Some of us have lost the wow. Some of us have gotten so used to church and to God that we've lost the wow. We've lost the awe. How are we doing out there? Uh, there's a part which, which Paul says to the Corinthians, I want you to receive Titus with fear and trembling. What? I mean, it wasn't like this Titus was this burly guy, you know. But he's saying, look, I want you to receive Titus because here's a Greek that just became a believer. Wow. Are you following this at all? Yeah. All right, now stay with me. It's not, it's not done yet. <laughs> Remember that in the original language, there is no punctuation or verses. How many of you knew that? Like, we, we, you know, we, we're lucky. We get to read the Bible. Not lucky. I mean, that's kind of, I guess, yes and no. Depends. In this situation, we're not. But we're, for the most part, lucky because we can read the Bible with verses and punctuation. And for the most part, they did a fairly good job. But remember, in the original Hebrew, in the original Greek, there is no punctuation. There are no verses. Try to imagine reading that kind of a Bible. So let me present to you a different perspective on this. Are you ready? Work out your, uh, your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Is it possible that what Paul is saying is, I need you to be wowed by the fact that as you work unitedly, as you move towards working this out, you will know that it is God that's working in you as you're working out, God is working in to will, that is to what? To desire and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Are you catching this? In other words, be wowed by this. He's not saying work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's saying work out your salvation. In other words, work this thing out. And then he's saying, and with fear and trembling, uh, fear and trembling, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order for his good purpose. 
It can only say that, and I tell you why. Because the Bible does not contradict itself. Paul cannot say four, five, six, eight, ten times salvation is by grace alone. And then in this one say, no, actually you have to work. It cannot be. So we must understand it within the context of what's going on. Have I lost anybody? Really? Because I lost myself sometimes. <laughs> In other words, what Paul was saying is be prepared to be awed. Be prepared to be wild because God is going to do some amazing things. And then he says in Philippians 2... He says, look, just in case you're not getting what I'm saying, let me get practical with you, okay? Do everything without grumbling or arguing. <laughs> I mean, please, stop the grumbling, stop the arguing. You're like my ancestors when they walked in the desert, please. I mean, they, they had taken grumbling to a whole new level. Please don't do that. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you what? may become blameless and pure. Wow. Now, here it is again. This one's a little tough. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Now, that's a little bit of a tall order, isn't it? How many of you here today are without fault? Blameless. Anybody here? Well, this is what Paul is saying to do, right? To be blameless and to be without fault. Nobody? Nobody's going to raise their hand on this one? Now, let me start off with this idea of a warped and crooked generation. I don't know about you. In fact, I was talking this morning to a friend and every time I read the news, I think we're living in a warped and crooked generation. Doesn't it feel like it's becoming more and more like that? Let me get serious for a moment here. I think, I think Paul wrote this to the Philippians, but I think today we can certainly contextualize this in our lives. In fact, I think our generation has become more and more warped and more and more crooked to the point where we are struggling to trust anything. Are you with me on this? Are you following what I'm saying here? And if there was ever a time that we need to be awed by God, this is it. If there was ever a time that we need to stop the arguing and the grumbling and to be united, this is it. In a world where arguing and grumbling is becoming the norm, what would a group of Christians that don't argue and grumble, that are united, even amongst their differences. What does that do to the world? Well, Paul says what it does, right? Paul is admonishing both the church at Philippi and the church today to stop grumbling, to start arguing. That is the only true hope that has impacted the divided world. And, and he says this. This is really important. He says, and by the way, yeah, before we do that, let, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm so excited about this. Sorry. But uh, um, let me, okay, hold on. Go back. Okay, here we go. So uh, this idea of children of God without fault is really, really important. Because here's what I know. I believe that the only way that I can be without fault is if Christ presents me without fault. In fact, Jude puts it this way. To him who is able to keep you from what? Stumbling, from falling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Who's that? Jesus. Think about this. Jesus is wanting to present us before God's glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Isn't that amazing? I, I mean, I always, I've always read the without fault part. I thought, ah, oh, that's great. I never thought about the with the great joy part. I mean, it's Jesus going, Dad, let me introduce you to Sergio. He's my friend. I mean, think about that. 
And then he says, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. When Brianna began crawling, uh, she must have been like one and a half, I don't remember. But we were so excited that she was moving on her own. And then one day, she got a hold of a table and she stood up. Her legs were going like this, you know. And we're like, oh, hold it right there. And then she fell. And we're like, it's okay, it's okay, come on, stand up. And then I picked her up, or Nancy, I can't remember who, picked her up, held her by, by her two hands, keep her from what? Falling. Falling. Right? And then, of course, Brianna is extremely um, independent. She gets that from her mom. And, 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 and she let go, and she kept going, and then boom, she fell. And what did we do? We picked her up again. She must have fallen about 40, 50 times before she finally started walking on her own. By about the 40th time, we were like, you know what? Forget you. We kicked her. We just, you know, you're, you're no good. You're, you're never going to walk. You're going to be, you're a waste. Is that what we did? Of course not. We're good parents. We waited to the hundredth time. Now, really, let's be honest. Have we ever done that? I mean, your parents, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you, you know how many times your kids have fallen, and not maybe necessarily physically. Over and over again, is there ever a time that you say, enough is enough, I'm done, you're done, that's it. Then why would we believe that God is like that? I'll never forget teaching her how to ride a bicycle. She got on the bicycle, and I held this side, and then I held the back. And then after a while, as I'm walking with her, I let go of this side. And she said, don't let go of that. I'm like, no problem. And so I walked with her, making sure she would not fall. And then one day, as I'm walking with her, you know what this is like, right? I let go. And she's like, you're still holding on. Oh, yeah, don't worry. I'm with you. Look, I'm walking with you. And then she realized it. And guess the moment she realized that I wasn't holding on to her anymore, guess what happened? She fell. And so she had to do it all over again until she finally said, okay, now you can let go. God will never let go. Do you believe that? You don't sound like it. God will never let go. And by the way, if you want a beautiful imagery of this verse right here, homework. Yeah, I'm going to give you homework. Why not? It's fun. Read Zechariah in the Old Testament, chapter 3. There's this beautiful imagery of, of Jesus, our high priest, presenting us a, a burning stick snatched from the fire. And then he clothes us with righteousness and presents us before God. It's a wonderful imagery. Do not... I'm telling you, read it today. It's awesome. And I want to share with you a quote that I've shared with you many years ago. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing quote by a very inspired author, one of my favorite authors. And, and, and it just, as you read this, you could just tell how inspired this is, how wonderful this, this is. She, she writes, she says, Christ rejoiced that he could do more for his, disciples, for his followers than they could ask or think. In other words, there was no end in what he could do for his disciples and for his followers. And then he says he knew that the life of his trusting disciples would be like his. A series of uninterrupted victories. Not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. What? The life of the disciples, a series of uninterrupted victories? Are we still talking about the sons of thunder? Are we still talking about Peter? 
slicing the ear off of a, of a Roman soldier. Peter, who Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, like, really? But here's the key. Every time we fall, that's what we remember. That's what we look at, and we think of ourselves as failures. But every time we stand up, every time we allow God to pick us up and hold us up, that's what God looks at. And therefore, he looks at it always as what? A victory. The fall doesn't matter. What matters is when you wake, when you get up. Uninterrupted victories. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. So this is what Paul then says. If, we, if you are this kind of believer, if you are the kind of believer that, that is willing to stand out in a crowd, then you are like what, he says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Which, by the way, is, is, is um, reflecting what Daniel says in chapter 12. Like shining stars. I, I love that. What Paul is saying is, if you want to stand out, if you want to shine, then stop grumbling. Stay united. Rely on God only to see you through and present you faultless. That's how you shine. You want to be different from everybody else? From, from a broken, from a corrupt world? Then just love each other. I mean, that's not much, is it? Can we do that, you think? And so I want to take you back to one, one more time, finally, to this quote in Romans that says, And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. I read about one of the greatest inland waterways disasters in the history of the United States took place in the Chicago River on July 24, 1915. Now catch this. This is when I when I heard this, I go, ah, oh, this this illustrates what I'm talking about so wonderfully. When the steamship Eastland capsized. They lost nearly 850 lives. 70% of those lives were people 25 years and younger. Now catch what happened. By July 1915, the Eastland, which had been designed to carry six lifeboats, was carrying 11 lifeboats, 30 heaven life rafts, and enough life jackets for all 2,550 passengers and crew. Why? Because in 1912, there was a ship that sank called the Titanic. And it gave rise to a lifeboats for all movement. Among all of international marines, safety officials, lifeboats for all, lifeboats for all. And so when the Eastland, which had moved about the river many times, and now was being filled with people with all these lifeboats, and its maiden voyage with all these lifeboats, with all these people, with all the life vests, suddenly the boat, while it was still docked, began to tip over. And so they made an announcement, please, everybody move to the other side. And so they all moved to the other side, and then it started tipping that way. And they said, okay, please, let's try to balance it. And it kept tipping over and over and over. And the extra weight of all that stuff that was on there, the extra weight is what caused it to capsize. 
that which was added to save more ended up being the very reason for its demise. So I am wondering, first of all, you personally, what are you adding that you don't need to add? What are you adding to your rescue that you just need to let God work it out? For some reason, we have this desire to do our own thing, our own way. And we need more lifeboats, more life vests, more things I need to do. More. No, you don't. And then the second question is, as a church, I'm going to tell you right now, the worst thing I, I think could ever happen to our church is if we, if we lose people, and if we lose 70% of those are young people. And maybe we're losing those people because we're adding way too much. Let them be. Let them experience the spirit as you and I have. Amen? And the only way we're going to keep from falling is if we stand in God's love. Amen? You believe it? All right, then shine, my friends. Stand with me as we sing this song.